You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hey there, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 114 of the Common Descent Podcast. Today we're talking about polar life. Life in Poland. Yes, strictly only in Poland. <laughs> the one well, in the Poles. This is uh, this episode brought to you by the Poland Tourist Foundation. <laughs> yeah, new sponsor. <laughs> Stay tuned for a commercial later on. I assume you mean the extreme north and the extreme south. Yes, the north and south poles of our planet, the top and bottom, so to speak, that has a very unusual environment and therefore set of challenges for life. Weird temperature settings, weird light settings. Yep. The poles are two of the most extreme places to be on the planet, and that's in every aspect of the temperatures, the light, as you said, also the location. Like, they're they're not easy to get to in many ways, depending Mm -hmm. on which one you're going to. There's lots to talk about with what makes the poles the poles, and what life has to do to survive there, and what those areas of our planet have been like in their past. So those are the things we're going to look at. We're going to be focusing a bit more on the North Pole, because we already did a very close look at the South Pole. Episode 11, Antarctica. Yep, when we talked about Antarctica. So that really covers most of that area. We still will be mentioning it to compare and contrast, but we'll be focusing a little bit more on the North and discussing what life is like there. Now, the reason we're discussing this is because it was requested. Oh. This was requested by Janelle, Jeremy, Clavasco, and Austin. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, this is a fun, interesting, weird topic. And I think some of those requests were specifically for Arctic mm-hmm. discussions. So yeah, we'll, we'll we'll stay in the Northern Hemisphere a bit more. And polar dinosaurs, so those will get mentioned as well. <laughs> now, before we get into the topic at hand, or into the episode, some announcements. Now, I, I was about to say every episode, and really pretty much it has been, but we have a Patreon and that Patreon funds this podcast top to bottom. Which That's is, right. You go patreon.com slash common descent podcast. Yeah, and it's awesome. And it's amazing. And so are the people on it who are our patrons. And if you patron with us at a certain level, we like to shout your name out at the beginning of episodes to thank you and welcome you. What does that sound like? It sounds a bit like this. Welcome to the Common Descent podcast, Quinn, Uju, Hobart's Obsessions, and Dr. Green Chicken. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Great names. <laughs> welcome and thanks for joining us. If you're interested to join our Patreon or support us, we give lots of extra bonus goodies like extra audio and behind the scenes notes. So feel free to check that out if you're interested. Indeed, we'll even do little mini episodes for patrons of the really high levels. And now that I'm thinking about it, I think we might be uh, ready to release some more of those. Oh, we probably do have enough. We did that once. We did it. We released a compilation of them and well, we've been building up a few more. So maybe that's coming up. Good point. And speaking of things coming up, Our next announcement has to do with another side project that we do from time to time, which is talk about movies. That's true. Each year since 2018, we've been taking some time aside to talk about movies in a series we call Silver Screen Science. We already did one episode this year. Mm -hmm. We talked about Godzilla vs. Kong when it came out back in April because we did other Godzilla movies before that. In the past, we've done Silver Screen Science series. You know, we did Jurassic Park when Fallen Kingdom came out. We did Godzilla and Kong when King of the Monsters came out. This year, there isn't like a big franchise or anything that we were you know, really feeling the need to jump on. Yeah, a lot of that, movies didn't happen this year. Yeah, exactly. Nothing that really lined up. So it seems like we are kind of overdue to do a thing people have been asking us to do for a while. And that is to talk about Crocs and Snakes. Woo! So in June, late June, we will be releasing a two-part silver screen science mini-series, I guess. <laughs> one about Crocs, one about Snakes. We will be picking two, probably the two, famous movies in these categories. So look forward in late June to us discussing Lake Placid and Anaconda. I'm so excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. Oh boy. And then, of course, later in the year, stay tuned, we've got Spooky, of course, way in October, and we might even have some stuff happening in between these two things. Yeah. So keep your ears open. Plans abound. And with that, we can wrap up the announcements and move on to our news section. Every episode, we collect a few bits of recent paleo, earth science, evolutionary news 
to keep us up to date and in the loop, and to keep all of you up to date and in the loop. And to start us off, David, what's the news? I'm going to start with a weird one. Actually, both of mine are really weird this time. Oh, it, okay. Oh, it's going to be a lot of fun. This first weird one is about how the human gut microbiome has changed over time. Ooh, that is weird. Yeah, it is. This is research by Marsha Waboa et al. in Nature, and we will link to an article in Science Alert written by Michelle Starr. So, dear listeners, if you are not familiar with the concept of the gut microbiome, inside of your body, inside of your digestive tract, you are host to an entire ecosystem and community of microbes. Yes, you are a walking city. Bacteria, probably fungi, all sorts of stuff in there. That is this microbial community that lives in our bodies, helps us to digest food, are often related to things like our immune system and just our general physiological functioning. Most animals have this. In some animals, it's how, like, termites, this is how they digest wood because their microbes inside them help them to do it. Health-wise, quite an important concept. If you got rid of your gut microbiome, you would be in a bad place. Yeah, and this does happen to some people if they have to take, like, extreme medications. And, mm -hmm. yeah, it affects their health for a while. However, not much is known about how our gut microbiome has changed over time. There is some evidence from modern day to suggest that it is an interesting question to ask, <laughs> especially uh, given our current state of the world, because apparently studies today have found that there are noticeable differences between the gut microbiomes of humans that live in industrial societies and in non-industrial societies. Oh. So if you don't live in like a city or in, you know, most people that live in our country, the United States, this is an industrialized society. Very much so. But in places that aren't so overcome with industry, yeah, your microbiome is different. And there's some evidence to suggest that those differences might somewhat relate, for example, to prevalence of certain diseases. No. Oh. So there is reason to be interested in how the gut microbiome has changed over time. This study found an avenue to at least start getting at the answer to that question in the form of human poop. Uh, yeah, that's what I assumed. I mean, how else are you going to get microbiome in Everything comes down to poop. Episode 30, we talked about poop. <laughs> We're bringing it back. <laughs> in this study, they uh, looked at eight samples of coprolites, or what they refer to as paleofeces. <laughs> fantastic from three rock shelters in the United States and Mexico that dated to between 1 and 2,000 years old, making this one of the youngest news items <laughs> that we discuss on the podcast. Yeah. Fairly recent, but a couple millennia ago, within these paleofeces, they were able to get genomic analysis enough to recover microbial genomes of about 500 different types, right? 500 different genomes of microbes in these ancient poops, and of those, they identified that 181 of them seem, with strong evidence, to likely be gut microbes. Okay. From these humans who pooped these poops. And with all the information we have about modern gut microbiomes, they were able to compare. So well, they found a number of interesting differences, but more differences with industrial societies today. The gut microbiomes of these one to two thousand year old humans were more similar to modern day non-industrial people, which makes sense. On top of that, about 39% of the genomes they identified are not seen in modern microbiomes of humans. All right, that's decent. Just a whole chunk of this ancient gut microbiome is no longer with us humans. They found a few specific differences within the genetics, so there were differing amounts of genes for breaking down certain molecules, like certain sugars are less prioritized, it seems, in these ancient microbiomes. Also, fewer genes associated with antibiotic resistance, <laughs> which makes sense, right? Yeah. That's something we've built ourselves into these days. Yeah, both of those, we, we've increased our sugar intake and we've increased our <laughs> antibacterial stuff. Yeah, and indeed, they, they say that they found more genes related to starch and glycogen degrading enzymes. So enzymes for breaking down those materials 
And they suggest possibly because diets these days, and especially in industrial uh, cultures, are relatively lacking in complex carbohydrates relative to simple sugars Mm -hmm. within the diet. Another thing they noticed, which is also similar to modern non-industrial cultures, is that there are the genetics of these ancient guts had more what they call mobile elements, which is to say the enzymes that help break down and rearrange DNA. Oh. That the DNA seems to have been producing more enzymes for more shuffling of the DNA, which is a feature really good for adaptation. Yes. Right? The more mixing you get in your DNA, the better you are, on average, going to be able to adapt over evolutionary time. Yeah, the more chances you gain for, for beneficial rearrangements or mutations. So all this suggests the beginnings of some interesting conclusions. The authors propose that the greater diversity that we're seeing in these gut microbiomes and that mobility might both be adaptations for more diverse diets and less stable environments. Yeah. That if you think about especially modern industrial society, our, like, what is available to us in terms of food, in terms of the uh, 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 physiological changes... Basically, it's the same in the summer as it is in the winter. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's the same last year as it is this year. There's not as much of a need for diversity in our gut microbiome. And so maybe we've lost some of that. Yeah, even generation to generation, a lot of diets are fairly similar. Yeah. Now, their sample is relatively small. This is eight poops. And I I like to think that 181 microbe genomes is pretty good but it sounds like there may be plenty more to find so this really feels like uh from my understanding which is limited and also from the article that this is sort of an early glimpse more so than being exciting because it tells us how we've changed over time i feel like this study is exciting because it's proof that we can get this information from ancient human poop yeah that this question is truly worth pursuing and that there's genuine hope of answering it And the authors point out a couple of avenues that this kind of research can take. One, I mean, one is we learn more stuff. Yep. We learn how things changed. Another is that industrial life is also linked to certain diseases. Mm -hmm. So like autoimmune diseases and obesity, which could be related to certain functions of the gut microbiome. So understanding that change over time might help us understand our own epidemiology as humans. And they also make the point, uh, which I had not thought of until they said it, that understanding the ancestral state of our gut microbiome might help us if we decide to try to return our gut microbiome to a more ancestral state. To Mm. rewild our gut microbiome. Yeah. Colon rewilding. Pleistocene (laughs) rewilding inside our bodies. (laughs) Which is nuts. I mean, yeah. It's... It's super interesting because this sort of thing, this gut microbes, is such a huge part of our day-to-day survival and functioning that we don't typically think about and doesn't often come up. And so to find out that it's significantly different from back then to today and that where you live has a huge effect on it, not just like Africa versus South America, but like what what part of those places do you live? What are you living around? Yeah. That's insane. And so... Yeah, I want to learn more because I want to know what's going on inside my belly and <laughs> how best we might understand it and, and improve it. So the solution, as the solution so often is, is go find more poop. Go find more poop. <laughs> well, speaking of ancient peoples, my first bit of news is about Neanderthals. Ooh. Specifically ones that seem like they were killed by hyenas. I'm so on board. <laughs> right? I prefer that to the, alt- the, the reverse. <laughs> This is yet to be published, so these findings have not yet been published in a research journal, uh, but they've been reported on by Sophie Ankel in Business Insider from Science Alert. Is I think the link we have is from Business Insider. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. That'll be in the blog post. This was discovered by archaeologists in Rome, where they discovered remains of some Neanderthals in a cave there. These mostly included skull caps and broken jawbones, so... Skull fragments. From what they could tell, the remains seem to include a a number of individuals and seems like seven adult males, one female, and one young boy. Okay. 
So decent number and an interesting grouping. It also seems that these individuals come from different time periods, so they weren't all gathered in this cave or brought to this cave at the same time. The oldest remain is roughly dated to 100,000 or 90,000 years old, while the other eight all seem like they're probably between 68,000 and 50,000 years old. Okay. Many of the bones show, cl- quote from the article, clear signs of gnawing. <laughs> <laughs> not all that unusual in fossils. No, uh, not at really. all. But these seem to be seem to indicate hyena gnawing. I was gonna say not just any any gnawing. Yeah, not rodents. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and not even like a lion. <laughs> I Professional assume... bone gnawers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which leads to the conclusion that these Neanderthals were drugged to this cave by hyenas, ancient hyenas that potentially hunted these Neanderthals, <laughs> or at least <laughs> acquired their corpse. Right. Found them one way or another. They also did find traces of hyenas among the Neanderthal remains in the cave, and remains of rhinoceros, giant deer, and wild horses. Oh, so maybe the rhino's not on these oh, bones. It was a bait and switch. <laughs> <laughs> the rhino said, we need to put some hyena bones in here, yeah, or that's else they're going to finger us right away. <laughs> So this looks like it was a den where hyenas were gathering, stalking, and coming, bringing kills or cor- carcasses back to feed on. And Neanderthals were part of that meal plan. Very cool. This cave collapsed, it seems, about 60,000 years ago, give or take, preserving everything inside. And so that's why everything's in such good condition. I like when we get a piece of news that is an illustration of concepts we've discussed recently. Yeah. So in episode 112, we talked about caves and how they're a great source of information, sometimes because carnivores use them as dens. And in episode 109, we talked about hyenas and how hyenas are awesome at doing all the hyena stuff. Yep. I like, you know, Neanderthal. We are not Neanderthals. We are not. It is a different species. Unfortunately. Or, yeah, a different type of t- thing. Ancient humans. But there is a kinship there, right? Those are our brothers and sisters. Yeah, we definitely hung out with them and were intimate with we, them. We spent a lot of time together. And so whenever it, it, like Neanderthals, I learned they did something cool. There's a little bit of like neighborly pride. Yeah. Where I'm like, oh, cool. Yeah, that's our, that's our old family. I can't help. This is weird, but I can't <laughs> help but feel a little bit of that kind of like, that's really cool to find that ancient humans were collected in a carnivore's den alongside rhinos. Yeah, right? <laughs> like, this wasn't just any predator. This was a, this was a, These were animals that were going after everything they could find. <laughs> well, I enjoy news bits like this for the same reason when people ask me why crocs are my favorite, and then they are very discouraged when I say it's because they hunt us. Yep, uh, <laughs> they sure do. I I love news pieces like this. It's nice to re- be reminded that it's like, yeah, back then we didn't have fences. <laughs> yeah, we the... didn't we didn't have fences with beehives on them to <laughs> yeah, keep yeah, the wildlife yeah. out. So yeah, we were part of the meal. We were part of the diet for these awesome predators. Yeah. I guess that is one thing uh, that I will concede your group of animals has over mine. <laughs> Maybe not in sh- in specific number of species mm-hmm. of crocs versus snakes that have been known to eat humans, but certainly percentage-wise. Yes, and, and intent. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to take a, a big old detour on my next one. You ready for another weird one? Oh, boy. This next bit of news is about an ancient symbiotic relationship that lasted longer than we thought it did. All right. This is research by Mikolai Zapolsky et al. in the journal that we call P3 to uh, save us from having to say paleogeography, paleoclimatology, and paleoecology. It's all about efficiency. And we will link to yet another article in Science Alert written by Michelle Starr. Crinoids. Cool stuff. Are a group of animals that are also known as sea lilies. Uh, Today, crinoids, broadly speaking, come in two forms. One is a flower-looking thing with a segmented stalk that at the top has a bunch of petal-like arms coming off of it. Yeah, leafy appendages. And the other form is that without the stalk, and they just kind of flap through the ocean. Which is one of the coolest, weirdest things you'll ever see move around in the water. 
Crinoids are one of those unusual groups of animals that are more famous from fossils than they are today, even though they are still around today. We still have sea lilies, but in the fossil record, especially in the Paleozoic, they are super common, major parts of ocean communities. They live on the sea floor, the stalk anchors them to the sea floor, and then the fan of leafy appendages is held high up where it can filter food particles out of the water. Yee. Still around today, but not nearly as commonly or famously. Well, apparently, something that is quite common to see in the Paleozoic fossil record of crinoids is corals growing on crinoid stalks. Weird. This has been seen in both rugose and tabulate corals, which are the two main groups of corals that were around and dominant during the Paleozoic era. These corals will would grow on the stalks, presumably as a way to get themselves elevated higher in the water column, where oh. the current would be stronger so they could easily filter feed. Oh. The, hitching a ride uh, to get, like like a vine climbs a tree to get at the sunlight. Yeah, these would cl- grow on c- crinoid stalks to get a better uh, a shot at getting particles in the water. Makes sense. This is very common throughout the Paleozoic, as late as the Permian period, but in the fossil record, it has not ever been noted after the Permian. This has seemed to be a Paleozoic thing until now. This research has identified two cases of coral growing on crinoid stalks today. Yeah, I was so hoping that was the next one. Now. Word. Right now. <laughs> so we've talked in the past about, you know, the, the, the odd case where an ancient group is found to still, you know, like coelacanths. Yes. Right. Episode 83, we talked about the famous story of coelacanths were known from the fossil record, and then it turns out they're still living today. This is a case of a symbiotic relationship that we thought was only in the fossil record. The researchers observed this off the Pacific coast of Japan, lower than 100 meters below the water's surface. Two individuals of a crinoid called Metacrinus rotundus, which were overgrown by a polyp of a type of hexacoral hmm. called Abyssoanthus, and by some anemones. Oh. Uh, which are close relatives of corals. Indeed. Uh, these in the group Metridioidea. These are all non skeletal. So, like, you think of corals, you usually think of them like looking like rocks because they're building mineral skeletons around themselves, but that's not what a coral is. It, that's what it leaves behind as it builds. Right. A coral is a soft-bodied creature. And there are some corals that are soft corals and don't build that calcium skeleton at all. These are those. These are soft-bodied corals growing on the stalk of these crinoids, similar to the way we see them growing on Paleozoic corals, which are different kinds of corals. Yes. Uh, those are tabulate and rugose. Today we've got scleractinian corals. This is the first detailed record and examination of this association in modern animals. The authors note that the corals don't seem to be competing for food with the crinoid because they are below the feeding fan. Mm -hmm. They're not in the mouth region, right? They're not getting in the way. And uh, they don't seem to be affecting the mobility of the stalk at all. And... Unlike the Paleozoic examples we have from the fossil record, the coral and anemones growing on these stalks don't seem to have altered the structure of the stalk. That in the fossil examples, they would actually change the shape of the stalk because they were on there. These don't seem to be doing it. It seems like they're just hanging on. Yeah, just just using you as a ladder and nothing more. Yep. This is interesting for two reasons, mainly. One... How cool is that? Mm -hmm. This was a symbiotic relationship we thought was gone and is still happening today, albeit uh, presumably rarer and on a group of animals that we don't pay as much attention to (laughs) as we did their fossil uh, uh, relatives. But also the authors point out that there's a good chance this has been going on since the Paleozoic. One, because it's still happening today, but also because... The example we're seeing here isn't skeletal corals and isn't altering the structure of the crinoid stock. Soft-bodied animals 
don't tend to fossilize very well. And if the crinoid stock is unchanged, there's very little chance for fossil evidence of it. Yeah, there's no trace left behind by this soft, squishy coral once it dissolves and uh, decomposes. Yeah. So this could have been going on ever since the Paleozoic, and we've just not gotten fossil evidence of it. Which is uh, uh, so fascinating, because this is one of the rare times we can see, like, a behavior ish thing <laughs> that's carried over from one group to another with the but with the same host yeah and that's really fascinating yeah different types of corals well i they're probably different types of crinoids i don't know enough about crinoids True. yeah that's that is a good point they, they, it's not the same host but the same group yeah hosting these corals and that's it's interesting also because i feel like it, it's not something we think of corals doing no i'd never heard of it before no i i corals always build reefs but things like soft corals today do behave very differently than your reef building corals yeah and the authors also make the additional point that this now means we have a modern thing to study to help us learn more about the fossil thing yeah if we want to learn more about this relationship we now have living ones we can look at see this is why it's so important that we pay attention to the the oft ignored groups because who knows how much we how much sooner we might have found this if we actually cared about modern crinoids. <laughs> now we say that I I'm sure that there are there is a community of passionate. crinoid biologists very passionate. But yeah, I very rarely hear them discussed in modern biology. Exactly. Especially compared to how much attention they often get in fossils. Well, it's it's one of those issues where I was far too old when I learned that crinoids were still alive and was surprised by it. Yeah, like that's that's the issue. It's not that there are isn't cool research being done with it, but there's not nearly enough talk happening to keep us non crinoid researchers. <laughs> yeah, in the cool loop. So this is a, a call to action to all of our listeners. If you have an obscure weird creature that you're passionate about go study it yeah and go find tell cool people thing. about it tell us about it <laughs> <laughs> speaking of cool weird creatures that need to be talked about more side neck turtles okay specifically the oldest one in north america i'm on board this is research by brent adrian et al in scientific reports and the article we'll be linking to is a press release by midwestern university and eureka alert yeah. also all these links go in the blog post after the episode in case this is the first episode you've ever listened to of our podcast. Absolutely. This is a new species of side neck turtle. So side neck turtles are a group that we have around today. And unlike the typical turtle that most of us think of, or that is typically shown in cartoons and movies that pull their head straight backward into the shell, these wrap their neck around to the side to protect it. They typically have very long snake-like necks compared to your... your uh, normal turtles that most of us are used to yeah so if you think of like a box turtle or a snapping turtle pulls their head straight back and the, the neck kind of folds up and down as they go in side neck turtles sometimes called snake neck turtles yep the neck folds kind of in a loop off to the side as the head pulls back in and yeah there's all sorts of like google snake neck turtles because their their necks come out real far and they'll like i've uh, we used to have some at the nature center i worked at and they would like sit on a rock at the bottom of the, their water in their tank and just extend their head up to the surface and poke their nostrils out and then bring it back down. Yeah, no need to move. <laughs> this is a new species found here in North America from the late Cretaceous, about 96 million years old, making it the oldest side neck turtle found in North America. Very cool. This new species is Pleurotria appalachius, named for the region it was discovered in being the Appalachia, the Appalachia side of North America when it was split by the, the Western Interior Seaway. Episode 71. This is a Bothramiid turtle, which is a group of side neck turtles, which is an extinct group of side neck turtles. And this one has some interesting features. It seems to be adapted for coastal life. Oh, interesting. So this was discovered at the Arlington Archosaur site in Texas, which is a preserved river delta. So the Bothramidids originally evolved in Gondwana, the southern supercontinent that made up the bottom half of Pangaea. They then migrated northward during the early Cretaceous. And this turtle represents the, evidently so far, earliest of that arrival. 
in the north. Oh, cool. So this is a putting a bound on the timeline of their movement across the world. Exactly. So this is going to, with further research, I'm sure, give new perspective to how these turtles moved northward and when and where. And being such an early member of its group, northern member of its group, it has some interesting features. Uh, as I mentioned, it seems to be adapted for coastal lifestyle, highly, some highly aquatic features. The humerus, the upper arm bone, shows large attachments for muscle that would support a powerful recovery from swimming strokes, which seems to indicate that they're not using the flapping motion of a sea turtle, but more rowing motions huh. while they swim. Interesting. Histology, the studying of the inner anatomy of the bones, reveal that the uh, bone externally is thicker than the internal bone, which is a little unusual. Hmm. This is similar to later marine-adapted bothramited turtles. Gosh, I was going to say that is the thickening of bone is something we see in aquatic adapted animals a lot. So I was wondering if that's something you see as you get more marine. Exactly. So yes, this seems cool. to be more similar to later members of its group that went marine, but the cranium has a combination of more derived traits and more primitive traits of the group. Okay, so some stuff in common with the ancestral version mm -hmm. and some stuff in common with the more recent stuff. So this one does seem to have a, a unique position in the evolutionary lineage of this group and gives insight into how they got and when they got to North America. Very cool. This is an interesting group to hear about because this isn't just like a minor subdivision of turtles. Side-necked versus not side-necked, right? The Pleurodires versus the Cryptodires is the major division in turtles. Yes. Today, we talked about that in episode 60 about turtles. That, yeah, this is the other group of turtles. And they're the sort of the less diverse, less common half of turtles today. But this is an opportunity to learn about their extended history uh, from their, it sounds like perhaps more diverse, more widespread past, which is very cool. Absolutely. And with that, we can wrap up the news and get ready to talk and get ready to talk about the top and bottom of the world. <laughs> <laughs> So after this break, we'll discuss the polls. When we say North or South Pole, pretty much everyone knows what we're talking about. I would imagine. The, the tippy tippy top and the tippy tippy bottom of the globe that you used to have on the teacher's desk, yep. <laughs> where the pins go into the globe. <laughs> yeah, where you travel there and there's a big pole that has a stripe on it. Exactly. This is the points at which our planet rotates. Yeah, this, this is the point where if you stood exactly on it, you wouldn't know it, but you would be spinning in a circle. Yeah, you would just be looking around <laughs> without having to move. Now, those points are fairly easy to distinguish, but the region around them... The polar regions have a lot to them. They're very different from north to south, and how we distinguish where they are is actually fairly complex. Hmm. So these polar regions, the northern polar region, known as the Arctic, and then the southern polar region, known as the Antarctic. In typical technical terms, the area that these encompass is actually very straightforward. Because they are decided by the angle of Earth to the sun. Right. The Arctic and Antarctic circles are defined by the point at which, when you go above or below on our globe, on the summer solstice, June 21st each year, you experience exactly 24 hours of daylight in the north or s nighttime in the south. Interesting. So, should, should we talk about why that happens? So the reason that happens is because our Earth is crooked. Yes, it is It is both a sphere and a tilted sphere. Yes. So it is a sphere on its edge, which usually you can't tell, <laughs> except that ours is spinning. Yep. And, it's, it's, and it's, we should specify, it's on its side, it's tilted with relation to the sun. Yes, that's what we're comparing it to, with our orbit to the sun and the sun as 
the plane of our solar system. Yeah, if you imagine that the axis that the Earth rotates on, right, the the very middle of the rotation, that line of rotation is not perpendicular to our orbit with the sun, it's slightly tilted. Yes. Which means that in the summertime in the northern hemisphere, the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun and the southern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun. And then on the other half of the year, it's the other way around. And during this summer solstice in the north, it means that we are, that we are tilted so far toward the sun that there is no night in yes. the northern Arctic Circle. The sun never sets because we're facing too close to it. And vice versa in the south, during the same day, the sun never rises. Now that gets more and less extreme depending on where you are, but above a certain line on that day, you experience 24 hours of day or night. This line is found at 66 degrees and 33 minutes north or south latitude. Okay, so if you if you think of your, you remember your globe, latitude and longitude lines, the latitude are the horizon lines that go wrap around the Earth in the direction that it's rotating. Yes. If you go far enough north, above 66, at a certain time of the year, you can expect to not have a day and night cycle. Exactly. And that's pretty straightforward. It's a perfect circle because we're spinning around that point, so... You can just draw a perfect circle around 66, 33 latitude, and you will have the polar circles. This gives the polar regions a diameter of 5,204 kilometers, which means the circle reaches out from the pole 2,600 kilometers. Hmm. And there you go. That's pretty much the technical way to distinguish it the issue with that is that it doesn't tell us anything about the poles the environments of the poles right aside from your light levels exactly and then presumably you know that's going to come along with temperature and ecosystem changes and these regions can still fluctuate because our angle our axis of rotation does change yeah the tilt wobbles mm -hmm. this obliquity as it is known Shifts in a rhythm about 41,000 years. Mm -hmm. We slightly. talked about this in the last episode. Because this has huge effects on climate. So right now, the poles are currently creeping inward. You know, they're shrinking by about 14.4 meters per year. Oh, is that because our tilt is becoming lessened? Mm-hmm. Ah. So we're, it's currently they're shrinking a little bit. And then in another... 41,000 years, they'll start going back. So the size of the polar region changes yeah. with the obliquity of the Earth's tilt. That's, I, I, well, I was aware of obliquity, <laughs> like the stuff that we discussed in the last episode about orbital cycles, I had learned that it had not occurred to me that that changes the size of the poles. It's super weird. Cool. So now we have like where the day-night cycle shifts, but that does not give us information about at what point does it start to feel polar? You know, because... Right. If I'm a polar bear... Yes. <laughs> at what point do I feel comfortable? Yeah. Because the poles famously are the coldest regions on the planet. Right. Covered in ice, frozen year-round, just harsh, blizzardy situations. But this line does not always match perfectly with those conditions. Mm. The surrounding ecosystem affects where you actually start to encounter what we could consider polar habitats. Right, because the reason they get cold, I mean, half of it is that if you spend a good chunk of your year not getting lots of sunlight, mm -hmm. that's going to mess with your temperatures. But also, even in the northern hemisphere, because the Earth is round, the poles are farthest from the sun. Yeah. It takes a little bit longer for the rays from the sun to reach the pole than it takes the equa equatorial regions. And that little bit of extra distance saps some of the heat from the from the sunlight. It also is due to the angle that the sunlight is hitting it. It's not hitting it as directly as, say, the equator, which is getting full blast sunlight. This is getting sunlight at a glance. But as we discussed in the paleoclimate episode 113... Temperatures and climates and such are impacted by what your ground cover is, ocean circulation, mm -hmm. weather patterns. So it's not as simple as how much sunlight you get tells you what your temperatures are. 
So there are a few other ways that researchers who are trying to study the Arctic or Antarctic define where the edges, where the borders of these regions are. The Antarctic is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's Antarctica and the surrounding Southern Sea. Yeah, there's, a, there's a convenient continent down there. We've got a cap. And so, yeah, it's that and then the water around it. Now, where the edge of that is, is typically described as the zone of Antarctic convergence, which is where Antarctic cold polar water meets the warmer waters of the north. Hmm. And these colder, very salt-rich waters sink below the warmer waters coming from the north, and this area of convergence distinguishes the edge of the polar region. Gotcha. Now, of course, this means that the boundary is not perfect. It can be, it can change depending on currents and the surrounding landmass, and is is located in a different location than where we would go just by the sun. It is actually at fifty degrees south. Gotcha. So the conditions don't quite line up with a day-night cycle. Exactly. So where we would distinguish the poles based on the sun does not match where the weather and climate would indicate what we would call polar habitat, gotcha. polar climate. The Arctic is a bit more difficult. I would imagine. So one of the big differences between the Antarctic and Arctic, while the Antarctic has a nice continent and a ring ocean around it to really perfectly just stamp where the pole is, the Arctic does not have land centered on it. It has an ocean. It has a sea situated on it with land surrounding it. It's literally the opposite topography <laughs> to the Antarctic. Yeah, the when you look at a picture of the Earth or a fo you know, photo or even a globe that's marked, you see the ice caps, right? We talk about the polar ice caps mm -hmm. because it's cold and there's permanent ice up there. On the southern pole, that is an icy continent surrounded by shelves of ice over the water. In the north pole, much of that is sea ice. Yes. So... This means that while it looks similar, the structure and therefore how weather and climate is affecting those areas is very, very different. There are a few different ways, tools and techniques that are used to try to distinguish the Arctic Circle, the, you know, functionally distinguish it. One is, once again, with ocean currents, and it's the same concept where the cold waters of the Arctic meet warmer waters of the Atlantic and Pacific and the colder waters slide below those warmer waters. Okay. But that's only in the areas where water meets water. Right. There's no ocean in Canada. Exactly. <laughs> so you can't use this all the way around the Arctic Circle because a lot of that is parts of continents. The Arctic is made up of the northern reaches of Europe, Asia, and North America. And this ocean current delineation is very inconsistent depending on where you are. Some areas, it's very close to the day-night line at 63 degrees north. And then in other areas, like near Greenland, it can be at 80 degrees north. Wow. So way off from where we would expect the polar region to be. Because of the way the weather is there, the climate is there, it actually pushes those cold temperatures farther north. Yeah. Much closer to the pole. Another tool used that works very well over land is the 10 degrees Celsius July isotherm. Hmm. This is a, as they put it, imaginary line that where, when you go above it in the month of July, the average temperature for that month is below or at 10 degrees Celsius. Okay. So that's your polar area. That's once you get to a place where during July, you stay roughly around or right below 10 degrees Celsius, then now you are polar. Ah, that sounds miserable. Yes, right? <laughs> it's, so once you're unhappy, <laughs> it's polar. Once again, though, this fluctuates quite a bit. It includes a number of areas that would not be considered Arctic just based on the day-night cycle. And yet another tool used is called the Arctic tree line. Mm. And basically it's that the Arctic is so harsh, trees can't act like trees there. You still will find tree species in the Arctic, but they don't grow as trees. They grow as shrubs and, like, ground cover. Yep. Because once you get tall and get up into the wind chill, it just will kill you. So you stop getting trees once we get into 
quote-unquote polar climate. And there's a rough line where you can watch the transition from forest to not forest <laughs> to polar. And this tree line does pretty closely match the 10 degrees Celsius isotherm. That makes sense. So this one, these both are pretty good. But once again, not all areas quickly cut from trees to not trees. Right. North America has a pretty narrow strip, a narrow zone of this tree line. But then in places like Europe and Asia, it can be as wide as 300 kilometers. Mm. So not really a distinct, you know, it's, it's not really crisp. Right. So the, the border of the Arctic and Antarctic is a squiggly line uh, uh, by most metrics. Absolutely. And I've seen some globes that try to sort of draw that, you know, that try yeah. to account for like, this is really the polar region functionally. Here's where your your sleep cycle will get messed up. Yeah. And so the polar regions are a bit more complex to define than you might think. They're not just the top and bottom of the world. It's where do things get what we call polar, that ridiculously cold, <laughs> harsh, alien environment, that's what is going to affect life. Right. And even then, you know, we're talking about the harsh environment, but plenty of, especially as you get into the polar region, is going to be perfectly habitable. There's going to be a transition. It's not going to be that you walk out of the forest and suddenly everything is terrible. Exactly. Yeah. There's a gradation as with anything. And so, yeah, the edges are typically much more comparable to more southerly reaches. And then the closer and closer to the poles, it gets more and more inhospitable, typically actually inhospitable. Yeah. Where you don't find life at the pole. This is going to be one of those fun episodes where people who are paying attention to these sort of things will observe our very clear northern hemisphere bias. Yes. Because several times already we have done this. Yep. <laughs> We've gone, yeah, and then as you go south, you're away from the pole. Right? Yeah. That's not actually. <laughs> and the excuse I will use is that I already said we're going to be focusing That's on the true. Arctic. And so this was uh, written into the script. We this are, is planned biases. We are very geographically biased. Um, it's, it gets cold when you go north, right? That's what happens. This is why I like to make my D&D games happen in a southern hemisphere, because it throws everybody for a loop. Yep. I go, yeah, you're going to be traveling down south. You better dress warm. And yep. people go, yeah, wait, wait, what? <laughs> the world's upside down. <laughs> now, as we start to talk about what it's like to live there, the poles continue to be both similar and very different. You have very similar conditions to living on either North or South Pole. It's cold. You're going to have harsh winters. And then you have to get all your, your stuff done in the summer. Yep. And irregular day-night cycles. Right. And uh, once you get beyond a certain point, and again, depending on these conditions you're talking about, we live on a planet that currently, in our current point in Earth history, has permanent ice. Yes. If you are far enough north or south, there will be ice all the time. Get used to it. <laughs> but the diversity of life that's found north and south, wildly different. Yeah. Not just the kinds of animals and plants, but the amounts interesting the north is by far the more biodiverse when we look at terrestrial life that would have been my guess there's yep. more land space because because in the bottom it's all covered in ice it's all covered in ice <laughs> and it's trapped yes if you want to get to be a land animal in antarctica you better fly or swim there yeah or you better have thought about that yes. 20 million years ago <laughs> <laughs> but here in the north the arctic is easily accessible by all the continents that make it up you, you can just walk into polar Russia or polar Canada or polar Asia and yeah, you're good. So lots more access for terrestrial life and including both plants and animals. This also means that you see typically much larger animals walking around the Arctic, big predators, big herbivores. Down in Antarctica, there are no big predators on land there's no four-legged predators yeah. in Antarctica. So vastly different uh, uh, assemblages of life. Here in the north, we have things like musk ox and caribou to be the big herbivores, as well as rabbits and things like that. But then you also have foxes, wolves, and bears of many variety. Yeah, including the most impressive of the bears. The polar bear, uh, which is fitting because Arctic, is, the name comes from bear mm -hmm. for the constellations. Yes. Ursa Minor and Major is what the Arctic was named for. 
Yeah. Uh, the term Antarctic means not north. Yes. <laughs> and I've seen people suggest that the Arctic, because Arctos, yes. right? Bear. That's why Arctotus is called Arctotus. I've seen people point out that it also conveniently ends up suggesting bears, no bears. Yep. Where there are bears. <laughs> Even though that's not why it was called that. It just conveniently turns out to be true. Yep. In Antarctica, most of the things you're going to find on land are penguins. Yeah. Those are your terrestrial, your, your bulk of your terrestrial life there. But then you also have plenty of other flighted birds that are able to make their way to Antarctica no problem. And as you mentioned, a big part of this lack of terrestrial life is because there's not a lot of terrestrial <laughs> for you to live <laughs> off of in Antarctica. It's covered in ice, so you have to find those edges where there is places for life to literally take root. And, and rocks and soil. Most of the base food chain starts in the ocean and in Antarctica instead of being plant-based. And this is where the comparisons kind of flip. While terrestrial life is very diverse in the north, uh, one source I found had numbers like 14,000 species of terrestrial plant and animal in the Arctic, with only about 1,600 species of plant and animal in the Antarctic. So almost 10 times as diverse. The oceans on the South Pole, the South Sea, is booming with life. Yeah, very famous place to go study ocean life. It is so rich. Another num another set of numbers I saw listed the Southern Ocean having 10,630 species identified, while the Arctic Ocean has about 7,600. Oh. So a very different situation when you go from land to sea, north and south. Interesting. One potential cause for this ridiculous diversity in the Southern Ocean could be something that's called the Antarctic Biodiversity Pump, which is that if you're living in the ocean around Antarctica, happily, when things get colder, the ice is going to expand on Antarctica and the sea ice is going to expand. Now, when we say sea ice, we don't just mean the top freezing like a lake. No. This ice reaches to the seafloor. And that's true of the northern ice caps as well. These are frozen ocean, top to bottom in many places. So you can't just go under it. It will freeze you no matter where you go. So you need to leave wherever that ice is expanding. And as this ice has expanded over the last few million years, it will push sea life out of their habitats into deeper water, separate out populations... And when you separate populations and isolate them, that's a good chance for speciation. And then when it retracts, it allows them to intermingle again. And then it will expand again and retract again. And this pumping of ice could very well be what has led to such a ridiculously diverse ocean down south. Interesting. Now, of course, being subject to extreme environments, it has led to extreme forms of life. Because you can't just walk there. You can't just move there on a whim. Right. One does not simply walk to the Antarctic. Because you will die. <laughs> so there are some extreme ways life has found to live in the Arctic and Antarctic. Uh, many of which are shared across the two. You know, these are just adaptations to surviving the coldest places on the planet. Right. Even though different types of organisms live in both places, they've found similar solutions. Absolutely. Uh, this can lead to some crazy things like ice algae, algae that actually grows on or in the sea ice. Cool. They're able to survive in the briny pockets of seawater that doesn't freeze in the ice or on the surface of the ice and can keep functioning while growing near ice. But there are a few typical strategies that you'll see for surviving these crazy cold places. Uh, the most obvious is get out of there when it gets the coldest. Yep. Just leave. <laughs> you hang out during summer when it's it's relatively warm compared to winter when it's survivable. And then when it starts getting cold, when it, the sun starts going away for good, <laughs> leave. Flee toward the sun. Go into the light. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, migration is very common, uh, especially among marine animals and seabirds. Yeah. Uh, there are some extreme migrations that happen. Uh, the, my favorite I learned about while researching this is that evidently Arctic tern and skuas will migrate from the Arctic to Antarctica. Wow. <laughs> from pole to pole, because they're specialized for the pole. Yeah. And they just take advantage of both summers. Wow. So they it just, when it when it's summer wanes, 
It's just, all right, time to up and travel across the entire gosh dang globe. It said that during their migration, they'll cover a distance of 80,000 kilometers per year. Wow. <laughs> but you also see land animals. Uh, caribou are famous for their massive herds of like hundred, like couple hundred thousand caribou. Oh, yeah. You look at some of those like helicopter images and you look down and you're like, oh, that's a pretty cool forest. No, those are caribou. <laughs> those aren't branches. <laughs> But not everyone leaves. Uh, much like us, not everyone wants to move. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there are tools that you can use to survive in the cold. Some are very simple behaviors uh, to try to conserve your heat. The main thing you have to avoid is losing body heat. Because once you lose too much body heat as a warm-blooded, endothermic animal like us and other mammals and birds your insides start function stop functioning correctly they can shut down but also you can freeze literally yeah you're made of lots of water and freezing water inside your cells makes jagged ice crystals which ruptures your cells and tears you apart from the inside and it's horrible not what you want so there's some simple behaviors curling into a ball okay yeah assume the fetal position assume the fetal position <laughs> because spheres maximize surface area to volume they sure do so if you curl the more spherical you become the less surface area there is for wind and cold air to sap your heat away so yeah curl up into a ball when you go to sleep uh polar bears are even known to cover their muzzle because it has the shortest fur so oh, yeah minimize your exposure just physically share warmth herding animals will huddle together to share each other's warmth. The most famous of these are penguins. Uh, the emperor penguins in Antarctica. The males stay on the sea ice during the winter while the females go out and feed. And they incubate the eggs. Mm -hmm. And they gather into these just huge hordes. With pressed together. Head on the shoulder of the one in front of them. Uh, I saw one description that said. When they're pressed together. Up to ten penguins can fit into a square meter of ground. Wow. <laughs> it's, you're getting your max penguin to packing ratio. And I, I feel like I remember hearing somewhere that maybe it was penguins or maybe it was something else where they would shift who's on the inside and Absolutely. who's on the outside. And the way they do that is very interesting. In the middle, the air can reach temperatures of 24 degrees Celsius. Ooh, toasty. Which is toasty. In fact, too toasty. Ooh. It's too hot for the penguins. Ooh, okay. So the ones in the middle start moving out toward the edge to cool down. And the ones in the edge are constantly pushing in. So they are forced to take turns or else you'll die of heat stroke. It's self-regulating. Yes. Oh, well, that's convenient. And this allows them to cut their heat loss in half. Wow. During harsh Antarctica winters where there's no sun for months. And this is one of the main reasons why, as we discuss animals that have adapted to polar life, you will hear us discuss lots of mammals and birds and not much else. Nope. Because if you can't produce your own body heat, you can't take advantage of most of these tricks you've already lost your heat <laughs> yeah yeah you don't need to have it to begin with because you get it from the environment and it has none to give <laughs> and then also you can just hide yeah find a warm place find a warm place a crevice dig a hole let yourself get buried by snow <laughs> yeah well it's like the concept of an igloo when, yes. when i was a kid the first time i heard about an igloo i was like there's no way it could be warm inside a house of ice silly people <laughs> that's not how ice works but if you be have a physical barrier, it keeps out the wind and it keeps in heat. Yeah, it's like a blanket. Yes. It holds your heat. And that even is the case for ectothermic animals. You know, the snakes that live farthest north, like the ones that live up in Canada, the garter snakes, survive the, well, I say winter, but most of the year, <laughs> by hiding in crevices where they can be away from the elements. Absolutely. But there are physical adaptations right. that... Those snakes are not polar. No, they are That's not. That's an example. They are not nearly polar. <laughs> not quite Not quite far enough north. But there are physical adaptations as well that you can do to your body, that evolution can select for, to make you more efficient at keeping your heat and surviving the cold. Some of these include, and this is one of my favorite titles I saw, a way to describe these, is badly insulated extremities. Yep. And so this is the idea that the core of your body is what you need to stay warm. Like, that's where the warmth comes from. That's where your heart is. That's where your organs are that you need to eat with. That's where all of the really important bits that are going to keep you being an animal and not a corpse are. A finger is important, but not nearly as important as what's inside the trunk of my body. So if I can make my limbs as cold as possible, I will lose less heat from them and keep the heat inside and... 
I'm going to lose more heat from my skinny legs and arms and ears than I am going to from my thick middle of my body. So if I can keep all the heat in the middle and all the cold at the edges, I don't have much heat to lose from my fingertips. And animals do this by having the blood vessels work in a really interesting way. They pass close by each other, and as blood comes from my heart out toward the extremities, it's hot because it's been heated up by my little oven here in my, in my body, and it's warm moving out toward the tip of my arm, but it passes very close by the veins bringing blood back from the cold tip of my arm, and it transfers its heat to that cold blood. So by the time it reaches the end of my arm, it has cooled down quite a bit. And by the time the cold blood has reached my heart, it has warmed up by quite a bit. So warm blood is only ever moving toward the heart, and cold blood is only ever moving to the tip of my finger. Yeah, penguins have this in their wings, which I learned when I was doing episode 108. Absolutely, and caribou are famous for having it in their legs. And amazingly, their nervous system is adapted so that they don't lose sensation. They can still feel, they can still use the limbs perfectly fine when they are at or sometimes below freezing. Wow. So this allows for just a much more efficient management of your heat. This also going to have to do with breathing. When we breathe out during cold, cold days, I'm sure you've noticed a cloud forms in front of your face. This is because when we exhale, mammals in general, animals in general, when you exhale, it's going to be warm because it came from your body and it's going to have water vapor in it because that's how cellular respiration works. And that condenses in cold air to form a fog, a mist. But with many polar animals, like caribou, once again, they don't form that mist because <laughs> they aren't wasting that water and heat when they exhale. They have a very complicated nasal structure full of membranes and passages and lots of blood vessels that works in a really cool physics way. So as a caribou inhales cold air from outside, it passes these mucous membranes which are warm from the body and the blood and moist from being mucous membranes. And they heat up the air and add enough moisture so that by the time it reaches the inside of the body and the lungs, you're not chilling your lungs with cold Arctic air. And it's moist enough that you can pull oxygen from it efficiently. Yeah. Dry air is harder to pull from, to get oxygen from, than moist, damp air. And then when they exhale, the membranes have now cooled down because of all the heat they gave to the inhaled air. So they're now cold and a little dry. So when you exhale the warm, moist air, it cools the air as the cool membranes steal that heat back and the moisture condenses mm -hmm. on the now cooled membranes and you exhale fairly dry, fairly cold air. Polar animals are engineered quite well for the cold. It's amazing. So that way they are keeping most of their moisture, which is important because cold areas are actually very dry when it comes to liquid water because it's all frozen. <laughs> and they're not breathing out their heat and breathing in cold. Yeah. So it keeps their heat inside. But probably the most obvious adaptation for dealing with the cold is to make your fur and or covering thicker. Put on a coat. Get fluffy. It's, it's what anyone's mom ever told them when you said you were cold inside. <laughs> Put on something warmer. Yeah. Have thick fur or thick feathers. Your plumage needs to be thicker and more insulating to keep out the cold and in the heat, which is something we see in many polar animals. They have thick outer coverings of fur or feathers, but it's not just the fur or feather you want. What you want is to trap a layer of air. Right. Because air is much more insulating. It does not conduct heat as well as even the fur and feathers. And so a lot of times you'll see specializations for trapping air. Puffing up your fur is actually a good way to increase the layer of air trapped in your coat. Right. So and that air stays warm. Exactly. So you'll see that uh, happen with a lot of cold animals. You know, anim Polar animals, when they get cold, is they'll bristle and puff up their fur to get bigger. But they're trapping a thicker layer of air, which is acting as a physical barrier between the heat of their body and the cold of the Arctic or Antarctic. Some animals will also insulate themselves with skin and fat and such. Yes. Which we see a lot, in, especially in marine animals. Absolutely. Your walruses and your seals and sea lions and things that just get blubbery. Because getting your fur wet is potentially a death sentence for some animals. Yeah. Because wet water will sap heat way quicker than cold air. So, or cold water, not wet water, because it's wet. No. Uh, I'm not going to start that. Yeah, that special kind of water up there in the north. 
But cold water saps heat way quicker than cold air, which anyone who's ever hopped into a cold pool or lake knows is true. Health. And so if you have this nice, warm, dry coat, as soon as it gets wet, it is almost useless. Mm -hmm. But a thick layer of blubbery fat can, it's not as good as fur, but it always works both in air and water. So it is more useful if you're going to be spending lots of time in the sea. But you can even get fancy fur that increases your air insulation. Many polar animals will have hollow hair. Caribou, once again, have hollow guard hairs, which are the long ones that come out that are actually sectioned with pockets of air trapped in cells, little sections of the hairs to increase the amount of air that's trapped in their fur by trapping it in the hairs. Very cool. But my favorite example of fancy hair is polar bears. Yeah. Polar bear hair is transparent. Yes. Which uh, many of us who like polar bear fun facts probably already know, and that their skin is black. They look white because of the refraction and reflection of the light. The reason their hairs are transparent and their hair is black is it allows solar energy to translate, to penetrate through the hair to their dark skin and heat them up via sun power. Yep. But also, their hairs absorb long wave heat. Huh. Radiated from the bear's body themselves. They're absorbing their own heat? Yes. Back into their own hair. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Now... One of the issues you can run into with all these super awesome save my heat adaptations is you can overheat real easy. Yeah, I would imagine. If a polar bear exerts itself, runs for too long, it can overheat very quickly. So that's why they typically move at a very leisurely pace. So they have to have adaptations to get around overheating as well. Polar bears jump into the water typically because they're aquatic or semi-aquatic. Other animals like caribou have to get fancier. When they start to overheat, they can transfer some of the cold blood from those mucous membranes we talked about to their brain. To huh, so they have their own built-in coolant. Yes, that they can redirect, cool off the cranial region, cool off their brain so they don't cook their brain, and then dissipate the heat to the rest of the body instead. So they they have made this incredible habit of keeping separate the cold and hot fluids so they can redirect them as needed. Yes. What a bunch of cool animals. It's so awesome. But probably the most extreme way to survive freezing temperatures is to make sure you don't freeze. Right. Literally cannot freeze. (laughs) (laughs) At least you lower that freezing temperature by having anti-freezing fluids in your body. And there's a number of ways that animals can do this. Uh, Probably the most famous is the wood frog, which can survive frozen during winter for weeks at a time. And they do this with something called cryoprotectants which are chemicals that prevent ice from forming, at least lowering the temperature that ice can form, just like antifreeze in your car. Right. Well, then this is also what salt does on the road, isn't it? That it interferes with... Is that true? It interferes with the lattice work of water, so it doesn't allow water crystals to form, that's which is right. what some others do in certain ways. Gotcha, that's what it is. Other groups, ranging from plants to insects use something called antifreeze proteins. These bind to ice crystals and prevent them from getting too big. So they get in the way of ice crystals growing to attach to other ice crystals? Yeah. The thing that I quite like about that is creating a molecule that gets in the way of other molecules doing what they're trying to do is also the way that, like, poisons work. Yes. (laughs) But that's why arsenic is poisonous, because it does that. They have ice poison. It's it's so insane. You can also go the Ar- the Antarctic midge route. And the issue with freezing is that your water, you know, your body fluids freeze. Right. So if you just get rid of your water. <laughs> no, yeah, it's simple. Why didn't we think of that? Get rid of the root of the issue. <laughs> just purge skip the middleman. all of the fluids. They can purge. Up to 70% of their body fluids. Wow, now this is a midge, so uh, an insect. A mosquito relative. Mm-hmm. Uh, many insects can survive losing a lot of their water, but usually it's like 20 to 30%. Right. As the environment freezes around these insects, it draws the water out of their body. They dehydrate, cryoprotective dehydration as it's known. Fantastic. And then they can't freeze and in a dangerous way because there's nothing to freeze. And then when the water comes back, they rehydrate and they're fine. Just, just add water. Yep. Like a chia pet. They yes. Just... 
Or you can get down to the real physics level of it. And the way ice crystals form is on nucleation sites, right? These are things, specks of dust, you know, dirt, molecules that act as a starting point for ice crystals to start growing from. Mm -hmm. So if you control those, you can affect the way the ice grows. Some animals will emphasize ice nucleating agents outside the cells, in between the cells, so that they're not growing inside the cellular structure and damaging organelles. You grow it in between where it's less harmful. This is another thing that wood frogs are known to do. Wow. So you control where the ice grows, not if it grows. Or, like the Arctic ground squirrel, which is the only mammal known to use freezing protective adaptations, you just get rid of all the nucleating things, and ice has nowhere to grow. They purge their body of ice nucleators, and ice just can't grow because it has nothing to nucleate off of. Wow. And they just become super chilled and below freezing, no ice. Wow. So yeah, polar animals, they're pretty intense. Sure seems that way. <laughs> it's fun how adaptations for dealing with the cold can range from super complex and detailed, like what you're just discussing, to very simple. Like, there are a lot of cases where animals just get bigger. Yeah. Not always. Not all animals, but yeah, some it's just, yeah, if you're bigger, you hold on to heat better. That's uh, very common with marine invertebrates. We have what's called polar gigantism around Antarctica. Yeah. And it's because you're more energy efficient if you're bigger. So if you're a cold-blooded animal, it's not about retaining heat, but you need less food per amount of animal. Yeah. It's also, I always find it fascinating the way that ecosystems are different at the poles. Partially because, like you were saying, some things just up and leave. Yep. You're just not there. Some things you just go dormant, right? Some things hibernate when it's dark and cold. One of my favorite things that, that always comes to mind when I think about polar ecology is that bears, right? There is a bear species that is the polar bear. Bears are famously diverse in their diets. Yes. Right? All across North America, black bears and grizzly bears are omnivorous. And the polar bears kind of stand out as being hyper carnivores. These are not plant eating bears. They are carnivorous bears. And I remember the first time that someone made the point to me that's like, that's not necessarily because polar bears have to be, you know, by their physiology. There's just no plants. Yeah, what are they going to eat? Yeah, you have to eat meat. What berries are you going to find up in Alaska? There's no other choice. And like we were talking about in Antarctica, yeah, Antarctica is occupied by penguins. That mm -hmm. is the big terrestrial group you're going to find down there. But they don't feed on land because what are you going to eat? Yeah, you walk around on land because that's where the seals can't get to you. <laughs> <laughs> like you said, Antarctic environments are largely built on ocean materials as the foundation for the ecosystem, which also affects where your land life lives. You have to be by the coast for the most part, because otherwise you can't get food. And so ecological structure ends up being different because of the way resources are, are spread out, because of the strange conditions, because the fact that if you eat turns, <laughs> all right, you can only get them for a few months of the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're seasonal. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre. But the poles have not always been the way they are now. Uh, they've not always been what we would think of as polar climates. Uh, they've not always been cold, really at all, in some points in history. So we're going to talk about the history of the poles next, after this short break. So discussing the history of the poles, the polar regions, is kind of interesting because unlike discussing a continent, we're discussing a section of the globe which doesn't move. Right. It, we're not discussing a landmass that has changed over time. It what has been the case in this area. And the first most important note is for basically the entirety of Earth's history, it hasn't been the way it is now. Yep. And by that, we mean cold and frozen. 
it is very, very rare going back through Earth's history that the setup of the continents and the cl global climate has been enough to have permanent ice on both poles. We've talked about this in some episodes in the past that some geologists refer to greenhouse versus ice house conditions. And what, according to some, defines ice house conditions is that you have permanent ice at the poles. Exactly. And that is not the common situation of Earth. Nope. So we're kind of living in an anomaly, at least based on the past 4.6 billion years. Yeah, most dinosaurs would think this was real weird. This, is, this would be very weird. The poles have also been very different in the fact that the way they're set up, obviously, since our continents are constantly moving around, has not always been what it is. Right. There's not always land there. Exactly. A lot of times it's just ocean and, very often, not some unique patch of ocean like it is up north where it's surrounded by continents. It's encapsulated. Right. Just ocean. Yeah, it's, it's like if you rotated all the continents and oceans on Earth today so that just some random patch of the Pacific was the North Pole. Yeah, you're not going to get the same sort of polar current and isolation because the polar currents, especially the southern one, wrapping around Antarctica, insulates it and really causes a lot of the Arctic, the Antarctic conditions that we're so used to. Yeah, and that's something, and we've talked about this in previous episodes as well, that, yeah, having a continent over one of the poles means you have a foundation for all that ice that also reflects sunlight and heat, which keeps it colder. So like, where your land masses are, whether they're on the poles or not, can also affect how cold your poles get. It's not just that Earth is colder now than it was during the dinosaurs' time. It's that the continents are in the right place for us to have very cold poles. They are trapping the polar... Arctic and Antarctic frigid currents and climates on those two spots. So let's talk a little bit about how we got to this. How did we get to things looking the way they did today? For Antarctica, we we went over that story in great detail. Episode we, 11. So go check that out if you want the full rundown. But Antarctica has a much older story than what we would consider the Arctic, just because that continent is very old. Yes. The foundations for Antarctica formed almost 4 billion years ago, at which point they were nowhere near being the South Pole. Antarctica, for a chunk of its history, formed the center of Gondwana, the southern supercontinent that made up the bottom half of Pangaea. And that's starting around just over 500 million years ago. And then as Gondwana broke up over the ensuing hundreds of millions of years, Antarctica slowly but surely traveled south as it slothed off other continents <laughs> along the way and it wasn't until about 40 million years ago that the drake passage the gap of water between south america and the peninsula of antarctica opened and antarctica became isolated yeah which allowed for the formation of the circumpolar current absolutely which started to insulate antarctica and encourage the formation of ice about 34 million years ago. Yep. So Antarctica has been isolated for 40 million years and has been more or less, at least very cold or partially frozen some of the year for 30 million years. Yep. Which is a long time. Yeah. But in the grand scheme of things, not. Yeah. Fairly recent considering how uh, characteristic a feature it is of our world today. Yeah. Frozen Antarctica is about as old as grasslands. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and horses as we know them. But... That 30 million years has allowed for life to adapt to Antarctic environment and climate much more so than Arctic right. life. It's just, it's been that way for longer, and the circumpolar current also kind of traps. It keeps life from migrating out a lot of time and northern life from migrating in. So it's right. very isolating both climate and biodiversity-wise. It's like Dinotopia. Yes, exactly. <laughs> It's, it's Skull Island. You can't get through the, <laughs> yes. can't get through the storm. <laughs> With the Arctic, it's a different situation. It's not nearly as old a story overall. We, you know, we don't have the Arctic forming back almost at the beginning of the planet. But it's also more about the forming of the ocean. Because there's no land there to move into place, we have to move land around the Arctic Ocean. Right. And trap that Arctic Ocean in. And some land had to move very far. Uh, one area, the island of 
Spitzenbergen. It was actually much closer to the South Pole 650 million years ago and has moved 12,000 kilometers to now be part of the Arctic. Wow, a migration worthy of an Arctic turn. <laughs> yes. And so that's one of the big differences with the Arctic is that while the South Pole was the moving of one continent over the pole, this is the orchestrated movement of multiple continents and land masses. Right, to, to create this gap in land, which is now the Arctic Ocean. Exactly. So this started when Laurasia, the northern half of Pangaea, that supercontinent, began to break up around 145 million years ago. And the continents that made up our northern make up our northern continents today started to spread out around the northern hemisphere and encircle the north pole surround it and flank it Mm -hmm. the arctic ocean started to form between canada and alaska on one side and siberia on the other that's what started to hug the edges of this soon-to-be ocean and a little bit after that we see the opening of what's known as the amera asian basin Okay. Which is a basin, a area of the Arctic Ocean that started to expand and open up and is the oldest part of the ocean. Oh. And that was the true beginnings of the Arctic Ocean, the formation of this ocean. There are two major basins that are part of the Arctic Ocean, the Amerasian asian and the Eurasian basin. And then about 110 million years ago, the basin stopped opening when Alaska hit Siberia, not <laughs> it's it screeched to a halt. Yes, yeah. er, yep. <laughs> not quite literally the lands, but the plates hit each other, right? And it stopped expanding as those land masses stopped moving, right. locked in that shape. Mm-hmm. Now, while that may sound like th- the Arctic got an earlier start than the Antarctic, th- the onset of ice in the two locations may or may not be very different. Yep. So the conditions that we see today might not be the same age-wise, which is why many people attribute the diversity and and specialization of especially Arctic Ocean life, or especially Antarctic Ocean life, to this age. It is solidly known that Antarctica has been cold, frozen, for 34 million years. But when ice started forming in the Arctic is heavily debated. I've heard that. Originally, it wasn't. For quite a while, it was known that ice started to form 2.7 million years ago. It is known. Which is way later than the Antarctic. Yeah, 2.7, that's, you know, start of the Pleistocene-ish. It's yesterday. But in 2004, sediment cores from a ridge in the Arctic Ocean pulled up coarse rock grains, deposits, that were older than 44 million years in age... And the issue here is that these rocks seem to be not, don't seem like they could have been transported by just wind or water, which leans heavily toward ice being what moved them, scooping them up or freezing them and then thawing them out over the ocean, which then further implies that there were glaciers Mm -hmm. for this ice to break off from. And drop stones. And drop stones. And if that's the case, that means the Arctic froze before the Antarctic. Right. (laughs) Which is the complete opposite of what we thought for most of the time we were understanding it. Right. Which means that nowadays, we really don't know. It's still being very heavily debated. Uh, There are some people who think it could just be surface ice that could do it, so it doesn't have to be glaciation, actual glaciers, you know, thick land ice. But others seem to think that this may really step back the freezing of the north farther than we had anticipated interesting i imagine that it's a lot harder to study because antarctica is a continent and so you can study the history of a continent when you have that continent there but in the arctic we're trying to study from the ocean yes from just there's just sea ice up there right now and i imagine that's much harder to access absolutely but we definitely know that things were cold in both places as we entered the Ice Ages, yeah. as we entered our most recent cooling event on our planet, and things have been even colder, and therefore the ice at our poles has been even more extreme during those periods. It sure has. The peak was at 800,000 years ago, at which point the ice expanded farther than it has 
since or before on the poles as the way they are now. During this time, the Arctic sea ice expanded to such an extent that in areas it was over 1,200 meters thick whew, and covered an area that was roughly the size of Scandinavia. Whew. Massive amounts of ice. Yeah, and that's just the sea ice, not <laughs> even counting the glaciation happening on land. Yes. Yeah, during the last glacial maximum, the ice sheets went down. Long Island, New York, where I grew up, is glacial sediment. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Dropped by ice sheets. <laughs> So this obviously raises the question, with the poles being such crazily different, depending on what time period you look at them, what kind of fossils do we find in these polar areas? Are we going to talk about fossils on this podcast? Eventually. You will eventually have a uh, uh, paleontology <laughs> on, your, on your paleontology <laughs> podcast, yes? So let's talk a little bit about the fossils. Let's do it. That we get from the very north and the very south. I know that there have been, every now and then on the podcast we've talked about, and I've seen these like sensational sentences, sometimes uh, worth being sensational, of, you know, polar crocodiles and Mm -hmm. polar dinosaurs. Yes, there have been exciting fossils. Absolutely. And that's because at the point at which we had roughly things pretty close to where they are today, or at least much closer During the Cretaceous, we had land around or near both poles and warm enough to have a really diverse habitat, both north and south. Yeah. You'll often see these referred to as the polar forests of the Cretaceous. Yeah, which is a pair of words that you don't get today. Mm -mm, That you can't get today. (laughs) We don't have polar forests. You're not allowed. (laughs) During the end of the Cretaceous... Temperatures were warm enough and continents close enough to the poles that forests were able to survive and therefore a diversity of life and dinosaurs were living at or near the poles in what we would consider polar regions today and thriving. Yeah. But it still would have been colder in those areas than the rest of the globe. And you're still dealing with the weird day-night cycle as you go through the year. Yes. So you're still having to survive polar climates, just not nearly as frigid to, as it is today. Right. There's, it's still a weird place to be. And still likely was getting seasonal snows and freezing, just not permanent ice, not ice sheets covering those areas. Right. That's something that uh, often it's easy to get confused when we say, oh, there wasn't permanent ice. Or even in the Ice Age when we say it was cold. Oh, but anyway, winter's still cold and summer's still warm. Yes. It's just going to vary based on where you are and what time of history you're in. And during this time, we have sl- the continents aren't quite where they are today. So Australia is included in the South Polar region. Yeah. Because it's still with Antarctica at this time. And they hadn't so, broken up yet. Yeah, they, they were still trying to make it work. <laughs> Twitter was rooting for them. <laughs> and so we find lots of polar dinosaurs in both Antarctica and Australia. Down south, and then a lot of the polar dinosaur fossils from up north are Alaskan. Mm -hmm. That's where most of the findings that you'll hear about come from. Probably one of the most interesting things about polar dinosaurs during this time is that they're not particularly interesting usually. They're just like other dinosaurs. Because it wasn't so extreme that we see these really specialized adaptations or at least not as commonly as we do in Arctic and Antarctic life today. Right. Or at the very least, not in their bones. Yes, exactly. Because I kind of wonder how different a polar bear would look from, you know, a brown bear. Exactly. Would we be able to tell it was a cold climate animal just from the bones? Yeah. Now, once again, we went over a lot of the cool Antarctic and, and South Pole dinosaurs when we discussed Antarctica. But there are some neat things. Uh, Australia had its own polar dinosaurs. The Hypsilophodonts were these small, uh, typically like turkey-sized or a little bit bigger, two-legged herbivores that are very common in polar-aged Australia. Cool. That would have been running around during that time. Hypsies is what they're sometimes called. (laughs) I think that's what they called them in the Jurassic Park book. Oh, yeah. Pretty sure Hypsilophodon was in the first one. But in Antarctica, on the actual continent Antarctica, one of the things that is noticed about the dinosaurs is while they look pretty standard for dinosaurs at the age of 70 million years ago they look more similar to dinosaurs from 60 million years earlier oh interesting which may mean that antarctica once it started to become more isolated as the continents 
started moving more south, it acted as a safe haven for groups that were going extinct or features that were no longer sticking around elsewhere on the globe. Right, like Australia, where it's, in all the rest of the world, marsupials have been sort of shoved to the sidelines by placental mammals. But in Australia, marsupials have hung on and placental mammals haven't really gotten a foothold. Absolutely. Until we brought them there. Yes, exactly. Once we give them the helping hand that they've been lacking this whole time. That's right. One of the things that this might sync up with is the overtaking of flowering plants around the globe. Oh. Pushing out the pine relatives that were the basis of food for a lot of the older species of dinosaur. Uh, So the plant regime in the world changed and dinosaurs adapted along with that. Mm Mm-hmm. But in Antarctica, down south, you were protected from the evil flowers. (laughs) And... Older groups were able to persist for longer, oh, potentially. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it may have been acting as a refugium in that way. And you get some cool dinosaurs down there like Cryolophosaurus and stuff like that. So check out the Antarctic episode where we go in more epi- more info on that. Yep. But let's talk about Alaska for a bit because, boy, there's some interesting fossils up in Alaska. There sure are. There's lots of North Polar fossil, but Alaska has a lot of the focus and has a lot of really interesting finds, especially for dinosaurs. Much like Antarctica, when we go back about 70 million years ago, things were much warmer. We still would have had cool, probably snowy winters, but it was toasty enough that the dinosaurs we find in Alaska are also found in like Montana and Texas. Yeah. So like pretty wide ranging at that point because Alaska was very habitable. Right. It wasn't some extreme other environment. Yeah. It was just the top of the environment. Here we find things like relatives of T-Rex, lots of duckbill dinosaurs, your hadrosaurs. Uh, Edmontosaurus is by far one of the most well-known, but we also do have some of the more crusted hadrosaurs, the lambiosaurs. And for the most part of our understanding of dinosaurs in the Arctic was that they didn't hang out there. They migrated. Because they could. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, why hang out in the Arctic if you don't need to? Right. It's still, the, the lighting's weird. Yeah. And it gets kind of chilly, so they just, just move south. And that was the standard thought for Arctic dinosaurs, is that they, they were migratory. Uh, because there hadn't really been any evidence found, for the most part, of purely Arctic dinosaurs. Right. None that seemed like they were just in this environment or showed signs that they were staying there year round. Except for more recently, we have found some that may give evidence for hanging out in the Arctic, in Alaska at least, year round. Yeah, I think we talked about one of these in the news not too long ago. I do believe so. So, some of the arguments for and against migration versus stay and put when it comes to dinosaurs in the north. Uh, One is that a lot of the dinosaurs found up there don't seem like they would be able to make the long migrations. Mm -hmm. They're fairly small. A lot more of the hipsies and relatives of those that would have had trouble making thousand mile kilometer migrations from north to south. So it doesn't seem practical. It doesn't seem likely that they were all migrating. Uh, You do get dinosaurs like Edmontosaurus, which was elephant sized and would have been able to easily make those migrations. Uh, One research found or estimated that a browsing speed for them to be moving would be one mile per hour, which means they could move a thousand miles in three months, which would be plenty to outrun the winter. But there are some researchers who think that even these big dinosaurs would struggle to migrate because their young might not be able to make the migration. Yeah. That that's too long a distance for their young because their young don't grow fast enough to be big enough to survive the migration from being born in summer to then having to migrate come winter. This sort of thing is based off the idea that for animals today, caribou, for instance, have to be at least 80% of what will be their adult body size to make the migration. So they have to be mostly full grown to be able to migrate and survive. So if you were a slow growing dinosaur, if that percentage does translate at all, it makes it less likely that you'd be migrating. Mm. This was also the thought behind a, a dromaeosaur jaw. Uh, so cousins of raptors. It's, this is the group that has your raptors and those small two-legged predatory dinosaurs, small to kind of big. 
found on the northern slope of Alaska that's a juvenile jaw. Right. This is the one we talked about in the news. Exactly. Because if you need to be a good portion the size of your parents by the time you're going to migrate, this jaw would have come from a baby about the size of a small puppy with adults that probably would have been six to nine feet long, which means that this one definitely was not ready to migrate and therefore indicates that it was probably, it was born in the north. Right. Raised up there. Raised up there, which means that they were likely living up there, potentially. So the ability to migrate or the efficiency of migrating may or may not be as universal or as common sense among northern dinosaurs. And then we do have some that seem like they might have adaptations for staying up north. A species of Lealinosaura and Troodon, both found up in Alaska. Uh, Lealinosaura being an ornithischian dinosaur, so herbivorous two-legged dinosaur. Fairly small, and Troodon being a two-legged predator. Both showed signs of large eyes and large optical regions of the brain that could have been very useful during long nights, for instance, during polar winter. Yeah. Which could be indication that they were needing to both forage and hunt during those long nights and were staying put instead of migrating. So while there aren't seemingly super weird Arctic dinosaurs or Antarctic dinosaurs, they... There is still a lot of debate as to what they were doing in response to the poles. And this does have some implications on dinosaurs in general. If they were overwintering in the Arctic, that is a large amount of support for them being endothermic, Mm -hmm. being warm-blooded and surviving those cold temperatures. But even after the dinosaurs die out, the poles still stayed warm. And while Antarctica is definitely about to start freezing over and, and... just a, a measly 30 million years. The Northern Arctic absolutely had diverse and rich forests wrapping around the north, um, many of which known from Canada. The tundra there, which is the very dry region that we refer to today north of that tree line, shortly after the Cretaceous, was a fairly warm, lush forest. So the Arctic continued to be lush and vibrant For quite a time, even after the dinosaurs, it just switched over to not dinosaurs. Other stuff. Other stuff living there. Uh, Some of which you get pretty weird things. Jumping ahead a bit to just four to three million years ago, in Canada's Arctic Archipelago, there is an area found with remains from well-known animals during that time, like three-toed horses and black bears, but also miniature beavers. Hmm. So you got some recognizable and weird. There's also Arctic camels. During that time. Cool. That ranged much farther north than we find camels nowadays. But we start to see things become a bit more recognizable a couple million years ago. Two, two and a half million years ago. When glaciation definitely was starting. And just after two million years ago, we start seeing the plants shift to a more modern day Arctic set of plants. Versus the plants that have been there before, which were very much not what we see today. Right, warmer climate yeah. plants and such. They're normal northern plants. <laughs> and then as we get into our glacial period, our recent series of glaciations, things get cold. Glaciers are definitely forming and covering. So now we have a frozen north and south at this point. And during the last of those glacial map maximums, we get one of the most interesting Arctic environments, which is the Mammoth Steppe. Yeah. Which was a vibrant, rich, Arctic and cold environment, which is something we don't see today. This was the largest biome that Earth's ever seen. It spanned from Spain all the way across Eurasia to Canada and from the Arctic all the way down to China. Wow. Massive area, cold and dry. Its vegetation was very similar to the the Arctic vegetation today is grasses and herbs and shrubby plants. Lots of trees not being able to be trees. It was also dominated by bigger animals, mammoths and woolly rhinos and horses and big predators hunting those animals. The skeleton densities show that this was a very high productive environment. Lots of animals. Similar to today's African savanna. Yeah. So like a cold, vastly, you know freezing temperatures much of the year ecosystem 
that was similar to the hot, balmy savannas of Africa. Yeah, it doesn't have to be hot and tropical to be super diverse. You even got weird things like hyenas, which we talked about in our hyenas episode. Yep. Roaming around the steppe. One of the interesting things, though, is that it seems this environment was largely maintained not just by the climate, but by the herbivores. Oh, yeah. They were a keystone species to keeping this going as they trampled mosses and shrubs to maintain the pastures of this area. And interestingly enough, analysis of climate dynamics today show that our modern situation in Siberia and Alaska and across the Yukon are very close to the conditions during the Mammoth Steppe. So it doesn't seem that the climate got rid of the Mammoth Steppe, but losing the animals yeah. got rid of the Mammoth Steppe, which and, could potentially be our fault. And indeed, uh, some people are trying to bring it back. Yes, they are. We talked about that in episode 8 and I think episode 35. And all the studies seem to show that it would be possible if those herbivores were to start stamping mosses and clearing pasture again hey, get those mammoths up there <laughs> but finally the last two things i want to mention about arctic fossils is that every now and then we find really interesting fossils in the arctics in the arctic and antarctic that have nothing to do with them being at the poles but are just very interesting finds in the arctic the oldest known fungus on earth was discovered in the can in canada just a couple years ago in 2019 this fossil fungus took the form of little spores connected by filaments and is known as Orosphera geraldae and dates back to about somewhere between 900 million and 1 billion years old. Ooh. The oldest fungus we know of. Cool. From the Canadian Arctic, which was not at the pole when it would have formed. Right, that just is where it is now. It's where we found it. And then also in Canada... Famous fossil tectolic. I was gonna. I, I was waiting yep. to see if you mentioned it, and if you didn't, I was gonna mention it. Absolutely. This is the famous, really good example. Fishapod. Fishapod of the transition from fish to tetrapod. Episode seventy-seven. And once again, has nothing to do with it being at the pole, but we found it there now. So there's also just unrelated polar fossils to be found now at these extreme environments. And there's also the phenomenon that you have fossils of animals from the poles. You have fossils found at the poles that are not necessarily related to in a polar polar environments. And then there are the fa there's the fact that modern polar conditions can affect paleontology. Exactly. Not just in the sense that that not a lot of work gets done up there because it's hard and it's cold. Yeah. And but dangerous. <laughs> we've talked before about how permafrost is great at preserving fossils and in many cases dna yes some of the most well-preserved frozen animals are from siberia and you get them from permafrost places and there's also the interesting fact of our modern world that there are a number of places where especially i've heard about this with archaeological sites are becoming more accessible yes because the ice is melting in our warming global climate and archaeologists and paleontologists are, it's the double edged of, on the one hand, in some cases, it's, ooh, stuff's melting out of the ice and that's cool. We can access new stuff. And then other places it's, oh, stuff's melting out of the ice, which means that like the waves from the ocean can mm -hmm. destroy it now. Yep. It's when life gives you melting ice caps, <laughs> you make dig sites. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a fascinating situation because yeah, for so long. So much of the poles have been hard to excavate and explore, mm -hmm. which means who knows what crazy discoveries are waiting. You know, what's next oldest thing is hiding under the ice somewhere. Yeah. Well, and especially when you consider, you know, the Canadian Arctic, you know, Canada includes some of the oldest rocks on the planet. Yes. We talked in episode 11 about how Antarctica is an entire continent with mountains and rivers and lakes and everything under two miles of ice who knows what's waiting to be found down there which is why a lot of excavation in antarctica happens on mountains yep where it's not under the layers of ice and you can go above it we need we either need to really start driving our hummers around more or attach a bunch of giant thrusters to antarctica and push it north yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now there's so much more that could be discussed about these regions of yeah. the planet. This is like uh, what I said in the caves episode. This is several episode topics oh, yeah. crammed into one. I, there, I came across so much good information that I just had to ignore. So if you want to hear more about 
these topics, these various topics that we have discussed centered around two points on our globe, please let us know. You can contact us all the usual ways and we'd be happy to talk about it more in a later episode. For now, we're going to wrap up the discussion. But before we wrap up the episode... We have a patron question. We do. One of the rewards that our patrons get at a certain level is that they can submit questions for us to answer right here, live, kind of, on the podcast. This episode's patron question comes from Habib, who asks, Was the Mesozoic more dangerous than our modern times? You get the sense in movies that as soon as you teleport to Dino Land, you are bombarded with one dangerous creature after another. Though I'm just a city dweller, I get the sense that most animals today, even carnivores, are shy and for their own safety will avoid any unusual situations or creatures. Would it be the same if I met a theropod? Basically what I mean was, was Tyrannosaurus Rex shy? <laughs> That's it, a fantastic question. It's a great point because, yeah, no, you any half the time in movies and TV you go to the ancient times. Well, you and, always teleport in directly in front of T-Rex chasing something. <laughs> yep, and as Habib even points in the uh, in, in the original longer uh, version of this question is, yeah, you're going to get stampeded by sauropods and you're going to get eaten by big predators and you're going to get torn apart by little predators. And you get lifted in the feet of a pterosaur. Yep, there's also, away. usually there's a volcano or a whirlpool <laughs> or something like that. Always a volcano perpetually going off. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a fascinating question because we view our wild earth you know, the wild regions of our earth today as more dangerous. Like if I were to go into the middle of the Savannah of Africa, I'm pretty sure most people would agree that I am in more danger than I am sitting where I am now. Yes. That I immediately, my threat of death has increased. But if you ask anyone who like goes on photo safaris or goes on, you know, like population to, to try to actually find animals for research, most of the time you don't see anyone. Like, you can roam around a densely, like, biodiverse, dense place and not see anything for a while, either because it's hiding from you, or it's small, or it's just not there. Mm -hmm. Or it already ate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, even in the, you know, the rainforest in Africa, where we think of it just being full of life, you can still go a day without really seeing much. I've not been there, but I've heard reports from people who have make this as their living. Right. And yeah, you can miss the animals that fill those places quite easily. Yeah, par partially because of what you're saying, that yeah, things are spread out and the animals are doing their own thing, but also because your presence in an ecosystem isn't going to be a instant trigger for every living thing to notice you. Exactly. Right, you're not going to attract all the predators in the area. You're not going to freak out every animal within a mile radius. You're not even necessarily in danger of being hunted by all the predators nearby because there's all sorts of reasons why even if you did get near a predator, it, but that's dangerous. Don't do it. Yes. No, leave wild animals alone. But yeah, it's not like you're every predator is going to want to eat you right away. And I, I think a lot of that mentality that, predators will just pounce at the chance to hunt us is the the is the perspective that we are such easy prey we lack claws we lack teeth and right. we, we have no armor which is true but that's not like predators are having seminars of going now what you really want to do <laughs> is if you see one of these you go no hit them here and here that's we're not on their like oh someday on my bucket list well and it also comes down to the way and this is something we like to talk about th that we portray animals in film and video games and books and stuff is yeah like habib said in movies yeah the jungle is a terrible dangerous insta death place where everything is trying to kill you because that's more interesting in a movie because they've been monstrified they have you have monstrified the entire ecosystem yes. and then that brings in the question of how different were ancient environments and in this particular question's case, right, we're talking about dinosaur-dominated ecosystems, which does bring us around to a point that we have found ourselves making rather often in our science communication career. And on this podcast, dinosaurs were just animals. They were just animals. As far as we know, there shouldn't be any more reason for you to be trampled by a bunch of apatosaurs or a bunch of mammoths as you would to be trampled by a herd of bison or a bunch of elephants. It could happen. Absolutely. You should not stand in front of them. Yeah, those are all things that have happened to humans nowadays. Yeah. 
But it's not like dinosaurs, just because they were bigger or just because there was less people, you know, that we didn't have cities getting in the way of the ecosystem, that they were just like shoulder to shoulder, you know, every right. five feet there was a dinosaur. No, it's they still would have been spread out because you can't have that many animals in one place and have enough food. They're still going to be doing their own thing. They're still going to be mostly small. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not all triceratops. No. Most are our size and smaller. So it's still going to be fairly similar. You just now have a few that are way bigger than what we're used to today. And it does bring up the question of how many of the dinosaurs you encountered would be interested in a human. Yes. How would they react? Right? Because some you might expect would react, would freak out. You know, animals today, a lot of them freak out when humans walk by. And a lot of them will avoid humans altogether. But a lot of that is because they have developed in a human-dominated world. Yeah, we evolved alongside the animals that we are living with. Yeah, they have adapted to avoid us because we are very dangerous. Because we're real good at killing them. It wouldn't surprise me if you go to the Mesozoic and you walk up to a sauropod and it just doesn't care. And it also wouldn't totally surprise me if you walked up to a T-Rex and it just didn't care. Yeah. Like, you're weird. I don't know that... I don't know how common it is for predators to just eat anything that seems like it'll fit in their mouth. I assume that there is at least some tendency for most predators to not just eat anything that looks like they could. Well, it, it, you know, it also will very much depend on what kind of predator was T-Rex. Was it a generalist? Mm-hmm. You know, or was it like, no, no, I know which dinosaurs I like to eat. You know, a croc will eat basically anything, but snakes, you know might be you no know, i really i'm a rat snake i like i like rodents and so if it was a pickier eater you might not fall on the menu uh what it makes me think of is two things one is uh something i didn't mention about penguins in the episode because they have no terrestrial predators they also have no fear yeah. of terrestrial animals which means researchers that study penguins are often approached by the penguins as the penguins go hello strange penguin yeah. What are you doing here? <laughs> Where's your tux? The only thing that is on land walking around are penguins. So you yeah. must be a penguin. And I, I think it was Steve Irwin. I watched a video and he was talking about the the recognition of humans as a predator. And I think it was water buffaloes or something. It may, maybe it was something less terrifying, uh, but some sort of horned animal in Africa. And he said, like, I, he, to make his point, he goes, all right, I'm going to approach them, but not as a human. And he got on the ground and rolled sideways toward them. Huh. And they just kind of stared at him <laughs> and watched him. And he got within like 10 or 8 feet of them, like just a few meters. And then he stood up and they were like, oh, and a human. And they ran. Interesting. Because now he represented a predator. So yeah, if Interesting. if they've never seen something like us, which they haven't. Nope, not a dinosaur. <laughs> not a dinosaur. Yeah, what are we? They might just go, okay, yep. I don't understand, but also you do you. And to your point earlier, yeah, most of them were small, and no, you would not be in danger from most of the small ones. No. And but as a general rule, animals do not attack animals bigger than themselves, especially if there's no reason to do it. Like, I can't imagine any pterosaur, even the biggest pterosaurs. No. Maybe like the big terrestrial stalking ones. But for the most part, if it flew, I can't imagine it going after a person. We are very big. We're, you're not going to be able to eat us. We are more than likely going to be able to hurt you. Yes. You know, this is what I say to people about venomous snakes. You know, it's like, yes, they're dangerous, but a snake knows that you're enormous and could kill it if you get, if it got too close, which is why it doesn't actually want to bite you. Yeah, even if you bite me, I still have enough life in me to stomp you to death. Yes, which is very likely <laughs> to happen. So, yeah, no, my guess would be that most of what you would encounter if you were teleported to the Mesozoic, I'd say that most of it would not be able to hurt you at all, because nope. most of it would be very small. The stuff that could hurt you, either by being, you know, venomous or gigantic, is unlikely to want to. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't do it. No, and, and but then... <laughs> but you shouldn't go. That that third finger for me is, but then there are still big predators, and just like the big predators that are alive today, if you go hang out in the billabongs around Australia just wading through the water, you're not definitely going to get eaten by a croc. 
but your chances of getting eaten by a croc are way higher if you don't do that. Right. And, well, and also no one will be surprised if you get eaten by a croc. Like, if you hang out with tigers yes. and you hang out with crocs and you hang out with jaguars, there's a decent chance you're going to get eaten. <laughs> if you strictly like to float in the ocean around that area of Africa where the seals swim, <laughs> then your likeliness of getting attacked by a great white skyrocket right so like yes you still absolutely could be attacked by a predator or get in between a mother triceratops and sure. her offspring i don't know the her tritoc her cubs yeah her pups <laughs> her joeys then yeah you could absolutely be in danger but i think probably just as much as would be today so i guess the answer to the question what so there, there were two questions here was tyrannosaurus shy uh, probably not. Probably not. He's it, big. He doesn't have to worry about yeah, it Yeah, exactly. Much. Doesn't, no reason to be. And was the Mesozoic more dangerous than today? And the only reason that I might say maybe is that there were probably just a greater abundance of things that could really hurt you. Yes. Just because there were more giant animals around. There was a lot more animals bigger than humans than there are today. Yeah, we have taken a step down on the uh, size of predator that we are. And... The Mesozoic ecosystem would not be acclimated to the presence of humans, so they wouldn't know to avoid a human yep. necessarily. And if you're getting in close contact with wildlife, you increase your chances of being hurt. So I guess technically it would probably be more dangerous. Yeah. I but mean, not for any of the reasons that the movies want to think. It would be more dangerous also because <laughs> there's no hospitals. That's true. Uh, there's no yeah. phones. I couldn't call a hospital if there were a hospital. Your immune system is not adapted to deal with the uh, pathogens that are going to be no. around in the Mesozoic. My gut biome. Right. Bringing it back. Also, it's going to be a different climate. So mm -hmm. like the air condition might be different. It might be really hot depending yeah. on when in the Mesozoic it is. You might get a heat stroke. I won't be able to resupply on like deodorant or anything. This makes me think of, this is kind of the opposite of whenever people I can ask. be able to brush your teeth. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have a hard time finding food if you don't know how to forage. Yes, exactly. That's going to... And... It's and, more dangerous for us. <laughs> and I mean, if you're going back to the Triassic or the Jurassic, there's not even going to be familiar flowering plants. No. You're going to have to like chew on pine cones you or something. You won't be able to find fruit, like nice, sweet, juicy fruit. That's mm -hmm. right. So yeah, oh, absolutely. It's None gonna, of the water is going to be purified. Ew, gross. <laughs> uh, this makes me think of, this is kind of the opposite of when people ask about like, what if dinosaurs all of a sudden came back? Like how bad would they? No, we'd shoot them all. Yes. It's, we, we have guns, they don't. And that is the end of the discussion. Never has that equation ever gone the other way. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, that's another good point is that uh, unless you're bringing back a lot of tools. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going to have a gun or anything to protect yourself. So I, so in conclusion, yes, yes, it would be more dangerous, yes. but not for any other reasons. Not for any of the exciting <laughs> or interesting reasons. Thank you so much, Habib. That's a great question. Fantastic. And with that... Let's wrap things up. This has been a really cool discussion uh, that I, I wish we could have gone more into, but it was already long enough. Maybe we will someday. Oh, man, I don't know the setup to this joke, but I just I, I, the punchline is Common Descent Podcast and chill. <laughs> <laughs> we release episodes every fortnight. There is Quality a episodes. blog post associated with each episode that has links to our news and more information and photos and stuff like that. Thanks again to our requesters. Yeah, if you have more requests for anything, let us know. Our list is ever growing. All our topics are from requests these days. It grows faster than we can do episodes, so yes. we will never run out. Keep suggesting things for us. Keep your ears out for summer things coming up, starting with Silver Screen Science next month. And I think that's it. I think we're pretty good. All right. Well, then in that case, bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.